Good morning. I'm Gord Long with the Financial Repression Authority. I have Ramiro Leroy, partner and director of Integris Capital, joining us this morning from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Welcome, Ramiro. Welcome. How are you? Well, we have a clear connection, which is uh, which is outstanding. So, um, we, which is encouraging. I have previously had problems dealing, getting connections to Argentina, specifically Doug Casey out in his uh, ranch. Is he far from you? Do you know? Yes, I think he's uh, uh, up in uh, Cafayate, who's, that's in, uh, in Salta. That's more than uh, approximately 1,000 miles from Buenos Aires. Okay, that's the issue then. He's back up in, in, the, in the hinterland. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's sometimes he's actually on his horse when he's talking to me too, so that may be part of it. Ramiro, we, uh, we uh, are here to talk about financial repression, but a lot of our listeners may not be familiar with your background in your involvements and Integris Capital. Could you just give our listeners a brief uh, overview? Yes. Uh, basically, Integris Capital is a multifamily office uh, following kind of the, the model uh, of the U.S. of uh, an independent financial advisor firm that works with families and individuals in managing their financial assets from an independent standpoint. Uh, so that's pretty much what we do. Um, in the past, I was um, I work uh, at a, at Santander, uh, doing the the strategy and, and marketing for their private banking unit uh, worldwide. And before that, I was at McKinsey and Company for a little bit over five years. How was the how was the fishing at Camp Kotak? Because we've been doing a series with a lot of the participants. Did you catch anything? <laughs> we all caught some some fish. It was fun. It was great. That uh, that weekend is really uh, a unique experience to to exchange ideas and and talk you know, really to folks that are all more intelligent than I, than I, I am. So it was really really uh, exhilarating to to be able to participate in that event and uh, and to David Scott. Uh, uh, Married, it's uh, it's amazing what he was uh, able to accomplish uh, that weekend. So, for some of our listeners who may not be familiar with, this is a camp in Maine that uh, David Kotak invites uh, guests to, special people, and uh, it's a combination of fishing and and general discussion, right? Yes, yes, it's uh, a lot of fishing and a lot of discussion, coupled with some wine, which is even better. Uh, <laughs> Romero, we're, as I said, we're here to talk about financial repression, and uh, I, I believe Argentina is, has got a lot to talk about here in, in your experiences, but could you, we start with what does the terminology financial repression mean to you? Well, it's interesting because, you know, typically financial repression in the world uh, means basically governments keeping interest uh, rates below inflation as a way of taxing um, savers. Uh, my my take on financial repression is a bit different because in Argentina the experience we had was much more uh, direct in terms of financial repression uh, uh, enacted by by government. Uh, we had many experiences uh, throughout the years where where basically depositors in banks were bailed in, uh, basically forced to to take on debt. As opposed to their, their deposits, uh, so it's it's interesting. Not always financial repression means exactly the same, and you know because at the end of the day, it's a tax. Uh, the way that tax was applied in Argentina, it's a little bit different than the way uh, it's been currently achieved by by uh, governments in developed countries. Could you take us through some history in Argentina as it applies to? Some of these policies that really we could be classified as financial repression. I'm thinking about pensions and this sort of thing. Well, but, but, you know, for example, let's let's start uh, back in uh, you know when um, Argentina regained 
democracy uh, in 1983, we had a government that, from an economic standpoint, wasn't you know didn't do that well. They ran uh, fiscal deficits. Uh, the uh, export, uh, the, the prices of our exports were not very good. So by the end of that government, which was 1989, basically the government was you know heavily in debt, uh, in debt uh, was running fiscal deficit and high inflation. Um, but at the same time, in order to keep kind of things uh, going, they paid high interest rate in their deposits so that. You know, people kept deposits in the bank. The banks were able to buy with those deposits government debt. So it was a kind of a, uh, a nightmare in the making. Uh, in 1990, the government enacted, uh, like in midnight, <laughs> January 1st, something like that, uh, a, 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 a program called Plan Bonex, which basically took everybody that had a, a time deposit or bank received a, a bond, uh, like, like this in, in one day. Um, so maybe people were able to earn a rate higher than inflation before but all of a sudden they lost everything kind of so you see what i mean it's that that because it was a it was a bail-in the, the, the government didn't have a way of of repaying all that debt in the time frame that it had issued those bonds so they said okay this is let's let's do a reset let's issue a new long-term bond and you know uh, and start from scratch. Uh, and that happened actually twice in Argentina with uh, what happened in the Corralito when Argentina left the, com the, the currency pack that was enacted by, by Cavallo back in 1993. Uh, so Argentinians have a, have a lot of experience of basically their, their bank deposits held locally going south or basically uh, not being able to rec recover them uh, in the time frame that it initially thought. Uh, but many, during many months or many, you know, for a long period, actually you can make more in, in pesos that you would, you know, uh, that the inflation rates. But uh, again, so it's, you, you are able to invest uh, at a high rate, but then all of a sudden you lose everything. It's a kind of, <laughs> the risk reward, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's confusing sometimes. Isn't it always the way? You think you're making a lot of money and then it's gone in a heartbeat. All of a sudden, all of those false premises come home or false beliefs and change everything. How has it changed investment sentiment and investment strategies in Argentina? Well, the, the, these two examples that I just gave you um, basically generated a huge impact in the mindset of investors. So n now um, it's it's very difficult for you know a family uh, to have a substantial portion of their financial assets held locally uh, or held exclusively in the in the banking sector um, because. Again, because of the previous experience that we had, so even though you, you know the 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 rates that you could earn with the time deposit or are you know relatively okay, you know people are not very comfortable with the risk that they are taking. Um, not only because of the devaluation that could happen, or but just because people had bad experiences about recovering those deposits. So um, families here and pretty much everybody had has developed other ways of storing wealth from real estate to you know buying gold to buying US dollars uh, physical US dollars Argentina after Russia is a country that has more physical dollars in the world <laughs> believe it or not uh, it is not strange to go and buy a, a proper you know like a, a house with you know bag full of dollars here uh, and then you know the more you go up the ladder in terms of wealth you know, most of the folks tend to have their assets outside of Argentina uh, as a way of protecting those assets. Uh, not so much earning a higher return, really more about, I don't want to lose this. So store of value is something that's really understood by most of Argentina at all levels, high and low, and how to and have strategies and thinking around this. Definitely. Just basically, just to give you a sense, this morning in the in the largest newspaper from Argentina, or one of the largest uh, page, one of the economic section is eight strategies not to lose your wealth in the upcoming depreciation. <laughs> so it gives all the all the tools what you should do, and you know, because there is a there is a, an expectation that the government will have to devalue um, uh, in the next months after the, the government change. 
in America, if we start to talk about this, people think that you're just being negative, whereas it's it's a hard reality for those that have, have, have went through this for a period of time. How do you contrast what you see daily in Argentina with what you see globally and internationally with your travels? Well, the it's, mindset it's, is what I'm thinking of. No, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people compare, you know, uh, at least in Argentina, for example, what the Fed is doing in terms of expanding the balance sheet uh, as a way of, um, to some extent, uh, confirming that what the central bank here in Argentina is doing is, is kind of okay. Um, but it is really completely different. My take, and I know kind of the, the, financial, the financial repression that, you know, U.S. tax savers and European tax savers are going through now. It's horrible, and I think it's wrong. Uh, but it's compared to what we experience here is nothing. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, you know, I think there is. I would rather be <laughs> under financial repression in the U.S. than under financial repression in Argentina because the the you can't really invest long term in Argentina if you have this type of event. Uh, whereas in the US or in Europe, you can still, you know, of course, you know, have a long-term view about your investment, have a, a reasonable asset location and when you manage your assets, which is not what happens here, basically. What, what are your views on, our Argentinian views on, on what's going on in the developed countries with specifically things like quantitative easing for such a sustained period of time, zero interest rate policy, et cetera? Well, it's uh, you know, the the. I think my take is that they didn't go all the way in terms of quantitative easing, and this may be a shocking ex statement, but you know, here when we do quantitative easing, we just you know finance the deficit by by uh, expanding the, the the monetary base. So, uh, in in the U.S., they kind of went halfway. Uh, because of course you can't, you know, it's against the law. You can't really, you know, uh, uh, finance the deficit by by just printing money. But at the end of the day, if you want inflation, you know, we have plenty of history of how to create inflation in Argentina. So, uh, the, the, I, you know, quantitative easing at the end of the day, I don't think created that much benefit for the U.S. Uh, I think it's the only thing that they were able to do. Uh, and if you look at the numbers. It hasn't generated any inflation. And if you look at the numbers in Japan, it hasn't generated any inflation at all for I don't know how many years I have been trying this. And at the end of the day, it also perpetuates bad things going on in the economy uh, because you allow companies that otherwise wouldn't exist to continue uh, in existence and it generates all kinds of distortions in, in asset pricing. Uh, so I, I'm... You know, I don't think they, they, they kind of tried to do it, in, you know, but at the, at the end of the day, what they did, I don't think was good. How's the economy in Argentina right now? Well, basically, now, now we are, um, the, the, if you look at the, at the key numbers, you know, we have uh, a relatively large deficit. You know, some people say it's 5% of the GDP. Some people say it's 7%, but it, it's high. Everybody would agree that it's high. Uh, we have high inflation. Again, there are people say it's above 30%. Others say it's around 20%, but it's high. Very few countries in the world have inflation higher than 20%. Uh, and we are not really growing. It's We are kind of... Uh, yeah, I think the expectation is for the, this year is to, to uh, contract the GDP by 0.55%. Um, and at the same time, our uh, commodity prices, the prices of the commodities that we export, uh, are going down. So, and we have a change of government. So there is a lot of uncertainty and a lot of things that you know will need to change moving forward because we, we are just running out of dollars. We have fewer dollars every day, at least the central bank has fewer dollars every day that goes by because, you know, uh, the government has elected to pursue a strategy of, of kind of a controlled evaluation of the peso, but lower than the inflation rate to kind of uh, they use this as an anchor for inflation because if they let kind of the, the dollar go freely, you know, inflation will run much higher. That's a fact. You know, Argentinians look at the dollar as a way of, uh, of managing infla uh, uh, inflation expectations. So now what's going on is basically we have the peso, the official peso, very expensive. So if you want to export something, you don't get enough return. And if you want to import something, it's very inexpensive. Uh, so basically, everybody is trying to import everything. No one is exporting, <laughs> uh, and and at the same time, you see. So that's why you see basically the the reserves going down. So 
something will need to change. Uh, and uh, depending on who wins in October, in October we have uh, presidential elections, you know, something will happen. Um, uh, uh, whether it's on the, on the peso, uh, uh, a peso devaluation, or an agreement with the holdouts to get more dollars, but something will happen uh, that will generate a change. And regardless of who, ha who wins, I think it will be the good for the long term of Argentina because this situation is not sustainable. So, What about South America uh, overall with falling commodity prices and a lot of the economies being so dependent on commodities? Well, the, unfortunately, we have, we're seeing the cycle again uh, because what happens, you know, when, when commodity pr prices go up, you know, everything is, is great. You know, usually the, the currencies of, of uh, Latin American countries also tend to appreciate because you're selling a lot, you know, you, 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 you get a lot of dollars or currencies from the rest of the world. Uh, and at the same time, uh, in particular last years, when the, with the interest rate so low, a lot of companies and governments start to kind of get cheap debt to some extent or at low interest rates. Uh, so now we have, you know, uh, commodity prices going down, local currencies going down, uh, and a lot of companies and governments with more debt in dollars than before, which is more costly to, to pay. And unfortunately, this is a cycle that Latin America went through many years and we kind of seem to keep repeating the story over and over. Um, uh, so the, the good thing to some extent is companies didn't go all the way as before in terms of indebtedness, but we're going to see some, some trouble uh, in Brazil, in some sectors in Brazil, some sectors in, in Colombia. In particular, all the, all the energy-related world is, is very... Uh, it's in, in trouble in terms of uh, of the credit side, uh, and on the government side, you know, we are okay. Brazil is basically trading below investment grade already, so, which is un you know, unbelievable. You know, three years ago, uh, Brazil won the you know the the World Cup, uh, the uh, the uh, Olympics game. You know, they were on top of the world. The real wasn't as high as as ever, and now we are. If you look at the stock market, exactly the same price as in 2005. And Which probably is, bordering on another into a recession as we talk, and 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 political unrest uh, really increasing in the country. And I'm referring to Brazil, of course. No, yeah, Brazil. You know, they also had this this issue with the corruption in Petrobras, which is really un, you know unbelievable, uh, or not necessarily unbelievable, but really the the level of exposure that that it took is was unprecedented. Uh, and if you look at the approval ratings for Dilma. I don't think I ever saw a president having, a few, you know, a worse uh, approval ratings than her. I think they are at eight percent, nine percent, something like that. Unreal, really. So, uh, but not sustainable. It sounds like our ratings of our Congress and our, our <laughs> <laughs> generally overall in America, and even some of it, our candidates here in the in, in the primaries. What do you think the reason for falling commodities is right now? And what would be the consensus that you would sense you would get on that? Well, I think it's a multiple. There are several things. Uh, yeah, there are a few things that are related to productivity. You know, for example, in the in the soy uh, business, you know, there is a lot, a lot of technology that didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. So now we produce much more soy than before. That's a fact. Uh, um, there is a cool thing in Argentina called siembra directa. It's the translation is like uh, like direct. Um, so, so, so it's basically you don't even need to move the land to plant the seeds. Uh, so it's very efficient, very low. So that enabled a lot of areas of Argentina that didn't produce soy to produce soy. So, so the, at least on the agriculture side, there is a lot of you know just productivity that you know we are much better than before in terms of producing uh, uh, agricultural commodities. On, on the oil side, that's a completely different story, and you have the OPEC thing going down and the uh, uh, iron deal going through, and Japan turning on the the nuclear reactors, and uh, and of course the Fed saying that they will rate, uh, raise rates, but they didn't yet. So um, it's not only about the Fed, I think, now. It's a combination of factors that uh, uh, are impacting all the commodity complex. And of course, China, with the change, you know, China 
everybody's complaining about China, but at the end of the day, China is transforming its its economy from a from an investment in infrastructure one to a kind of in, internal uh, uh, market one. So uh, yes, they are investing much less in 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 iron and all the the hard commodities. But if you look at the service uh, performance, there you know all those, the service activities is up much higher than before. So, uh, uh, but again, all those things, productivity and agricultural commodities, the kind of all the things that are affecting oil and China, and the Fed to some extent, and the Fed, uh, uh, or the Fed rhetoric, not necessarily the actions, uh, are causing the, the the commodity complex to go south. And there are two. Two sides of that, both the rhetoric and the realities of what, what they do do. Uh, you mentioned we're talking about investments and what the, the, the focus on store of value of all levels of investors here for, for, for many years as a, as a central core of strategy of investment strategy. Are there any more current shifts or, th- or themes that you're seeing evolve uh, on this uh, focus on store of value? Well, the, the the at the end of the day, uh, you know, a lot of people when when quantitative easing started, kind of a focus on gold, the store of value, and um, we we you know we tend to think in terms of store of value uh, in in several aspects. One thing is uh, in terms of the investment strategy that you follow, at least for our clients, it's very important not to lose money, not to have a you know a, a, a relatively large down year. Uh, because you know, again, this is, you know, the experience that Argentinians had with their assets uh, dictates that basically you can't come back one year and say, "Oh, we lost 10%." No, it's you know, it's not acceptable. At least not in at least in our our client world. Uh, um, so that's so in, that thing also dictates what type of investment policy you can uh, implement um, because the traditional investment approach of a, of a US bank or a European bank where you have a, a typical asset allocation doesn't really work with with at least our clients that's one thing the second thing is we are very cautious about where in which banks we put money uh, and so we are always looking at uh, at, uh, at the health of the financial institution where we where invest uh, our clients' assets, uh, because at the end of the day, you know, 2008 yes was an exception, but you don't want to be going through another uh, exception not properly pre- prepared to to be at the right place. Uh, so we monitor that uh, very regularly, uh, and it's one of the you know the core tenants of what. Uh, what we do here, um, and, and of course, then the type of products that you that you uh, invest. Uh, so it's very different to own something through an obscure fund structure that trades maybe every or that has liquidity every 30 days, than own something where you are the actual title owner, uh, where you can sell in 30 seconds that has full liquidity. So we tend to favor assets that are more liquid, that are direct, that have no hidden fees. Um, because again, we don't, you know, this is the, as you said, the, the, the kind of the, the store of, of wealth of our, of our clients. Uh, and uh, we don't want to go back with a situation where ah, this fund really, you know, we, we have a lockup now, we can sell. Come on, doesn't happen. So we, we, I think the experience between the combination of the experience in Argentina and the experience of 2008 really shaped the way we manage assets today for our clients. I, I, I really sense from everything that you're saying that, and I've read, uh, Argentina is actually at least five years ahead of a, of a shift that I believe is coming to many of the developed worlds um, because of your previous experiences. And it's interesting, not just the store of value, but even the focus on liquidity um, of these assets. No, yeah, it, that it's for, for us it's paramount. Uh, and um, anyway, it's, it's something that we, we definitely, for example, for example, in the 2008 experience, and I'm sure you, you, you've heard of this, Several of the, of the hedge funds, uh, we are still collecting side pockets of those hedge funds. So it's an, it's you know, in, we are in 2015. So uh, that's not okay with us. <laughs> so as a rule, we don't invest in things that can end up in a side pocket. 
<laughs> because <laughs> so unless of course the, the family wants and they have a you know a friend that runs a fund then okay we can put some money there but as a policy investment policy we only invest in things that we can sell in in a minute basically uh, without affecting the price which with for example we invest in some Argentinian bonds that can be an issue and and but we manage that in a different way but uh, but that's the only exception. In a nutshell, what what can the rest of the world learn from Argentina, or should learn from Argentina? Well, it's 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 different. I think that the you know the, the typical example that one would pick is is uh, Greece. You know, Greece is following some of the steps that Argentina uh, follow in the past, uh, and some countries in Europe uh, uh, are following the same path. Um, uh, that Argentina follow, uh, for example, when uh, they were in the currency peg, um, with the main difference that Argentina didn't have the the European Union in its back <laughs> when things went south, <laughs> went south. Uh, and uh, but if you look at the things that Greece did or Cyprus did, you know they're all all those were recipes that that Argentina implemented at some point or another. To try to contain the crisis, like capital controls or even bail-ins of creditors of uh, bank deposits, like what happened in Cyprus. Um, uh, so, really, at the end of the day, it all goes back to the fiscal side. You know, there are very few countries that can run a fiscal deficit uh, on a sustained basis without running into trouble. You know. The, the, the only one is really the U.S. because it has the reserve currency and everybody wants dollars. But if you are Argentina and nobody wants your peso, you can't really be running fiscal deficit always. It doesn't work. You end up with inflation and we, you end up basically destroying value for everybody at some point, uh, usually in a, in, a, in a shock type scenario. So if you are Greece or Spain or Italy, you can't be running fiscal deficit forever. Because it just doesn't work, uh, and I go back to to what John Molding always says, or in his book about uh, Europe. You know, you really can't be in a monetary union with so much fiscal imbalances, uh, because history has proven that those things end bad. Uh, and again, as long as people want your currency, you may be okay, and as long as you have. Other, other folks that can lend you because you are special, like, for example, Greece, you are special because you are part of the UE. Uh, but, it, you know, those things cannot be forever. Uh, so at some point, you have to put your fiscal house in order, which the U.S. to some extent does. You know, you know uh, we had 10% deficit, or they had 10% fiscal deficit in, G- in, uh, in 2008. Now it's much more controlled. Um, so, but I think the key, the key thing for, for uh, or key, the key lesson for Argentina is, you know, you can't really be really, really running fiscal deficit forever, trying to finance those with your currency and pretend that nothing happens. It just doesn't work. I think we need a memo to Washington saying that, uh, because we just we have the, the privilege of the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency, which in itself is a massive discussion. Yeah, not, not, not only the, of the U.S. dollar, but of the uh, U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy, <laughs> which is the, the combo. You need, you need both, I think. Well, well said. <laughs> J.P. Morgan was very clear on that about protecting his investments in South America and saying, well, that's what I have a Navy for. <laughs> but that was many years ago. Well, Romero, we have to wrap. We're up against our hard line. Can you tell our listeners how people could learn more about uh, Integris' ca- Capital's investments, investment strategies, and the approaches that you've taken, are taking? No, well, yeah, we, we have a, you know, of course, we have a website, which is uh, IntegrasCapital.com. We don't have a lot of information there, but uh, everybody can send me an email. Uh, we have a contact uh, a link there, and uh, and we can definitely talk. We have, uh, as you said, we, we, uh, or maybe you mentioned this, but we have clients from the U.S. actually that, that work with us. Um, uh, so not not because of relationships we had in the past. Uh, so, um, but definitely will be welcome. Thank you very much for the time. We're going to have to have you have have you back. Maybe next year after the next fishing trip and see how well you your your fishing improved. But uh, thank you for the time, uh, Romero. Much appreciated. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you very much. Talk to you again. Bye. Bye.